first of all, my name is Peter Scheidt, and, and I have the opportunity to meet, uh, <clears throat> I've not had the opportunity to meet and work with many of you, um, though I was here at, at Children's National uh, through the, uh, the 90s as the Director of General Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine, uh, before returning to NIH in, in uh, 2000. And then in 2010, I returned uh, part-time in my semi-retirement, so I don't wear ties anymore, um, to direct uh, what we now call the Grants Enhancement Program until I retired still further, uh, that's now led by Stephen Laddish. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have our speaker for the Jill Joseph Endowed Lectureship, Dr. Kamara, uh, Kamara uh, Phyllis Jones. But first, a word about the names namesake of this lectureship, Jill Joseph. Um, in 1997, Jill came to Children's um, to direct the Center for Translational Research, um, uh, as it's now titled. It was a different title then. As a seasoned, productive, and respected mid-career PhD behavioral epidemiologist, focusing on psychosocial factors in those at risk for age, Jill had realized that the value of medical training for her research and returned to the classroom for an MD and then went on for a pediatric residency. So when she came here as a strong hospital-based physician and pediatrician, in addition to her uh, own outstanding research in health disparities supported by a series of NIH R01s, Jill provided leadership to build a strong research center with the crowning accomplishment of winning the prestigious CTSA award. Um, um, uh, as the PI, and that award is now directed uh, under the leadership of Lisa Gay Woodward. With Jill's leadership and initiative, uh, the Collaborative Center for Health Disparities has now been awarded for 16 years, and this is a partnership um, of Johns Hopkins um, University and Hospitals, Howard University, and Children's National, funded by um, NIH, <clears throat> that supports health disparity that um, supports research, training, and out outreach to address health, health disparities, and it also supports the Health Disparities Interest Group that is the co-sponsor of today's uh, lectureship. At Children's National, Jill was revered and sought after as a mentor, a principled and demanding clinician, and a passionate investigator addressing the determinants and possible solutions of disparities in health. Jill could not make it back to the East Coast for this lecture today, but in talking with her on the phone, uh, she related that part of the intensity and the tenacity and the values that led her to her career um, came from her experiences and dedication and hard work that it took to overcome the challenges of being a 24-year-old single mother, and and that um, built her, her strength in her, her career. But she mainly credits her accomplishments to her collaborators and her many partners. Based on the impact of Jill's administrative leadership excellence as a mentor and her research accomplishments, upon her departure in 2011 to become the Associate Dean for Research at the Betty, Ann, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis, a, a very prestigious and, and innovative uh, new school of nursing, this lectureship was established in her honor. So, we'll pinch hitting for Lisa Gay Woodward, who, un, who is unexpectedly tied up with leadership tasks for that CTSA I mentioned. It is also a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones as one of our key research and education week speakers. Our grand round speaker this morning, Fitzhugh Mullen, an excellent speaker himself, commented how glad he was that he was not back to back with Kamara. <laughs> or he feared that he would not fare well in the comparison. <laughs> By way of brief bibliography, Dr. Jones received her BA from Wellesley College, her MD from Stanford University School of Medicine, her MPH and then her PhD in epidemiology from Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Health and, and well-being of the next, uh, hygiene and public health. She's a family physician, an epidemiologist whose work focuses on the impact of racism on health and well-being of the nation. In addition to her scholarships, she seeks to broaden the national health debate to include universal access to high-quality health care 
and attention to the social determinants of health, including poverty, and the social determinants of equity, including racism. She has received numerous awards for excellence in public health, education, and service. Of particular note, she is the immediate past president of the American Public Health Association. Dr. Jones is currently at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, where she holds positions as a senior fellow at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and Cardiovascular Research Institute, and as adjunct associate professor in community health and preventive medicine. The title of her presentation today, this afternoon, is Achieving Health Equity, Tools for a National Campaign Against Racism. Welcome to Children's National. Good afternoon, and I'm delighted to be here. This is actually my first time at Children's National. How is the sound? Because I have two mics. Is it, you're good, and it's not echoey and everything's fine? Okay, good. So I am going to um, hopefully embark us on a conversation. I ask people to move forward because I didn't want to be talking at you. I want to give you some communication tools, some frameworks, some stories, allegories, which will equip us to talk about racism. Now, you heard that I was the uh, president of the American Public Health Association two years ago now. In that role, I launched our association on a national campaign against racism with three tasks. The first was to name racism, that is to say that whole word, racism. You know, you can get the ism out. Not just talk about race or disparities or implicit bias and all. Those are important things to talk about. Diversity, inclusion, those are very important things to talk about, cultural competence, but also to say the word racism, because if we do not say the word racism, then we are complicit with the widespread denial in this country that racism continues to exist and continues to have profound negative impacts on the health and well-being of the whole nation. But beyond naming racism, the second stage in this national campaign against racism is then to ask, how is racism operating here? so that we can identify points of leverage, and then to organize and strategize to act. So I started out right out the gate talking about racism, and you guys are like, but wait, we're here at Children's National. We are doing health care for children. Why are you in here talking about racism? So the first tool I'm going to give you is what I call my cliff analogy. It's a way of thinking about different levels of health intervention, which I hope will make it clear that addressing racism is a core activity in the whole health intervention enterprise. So here we go. I hope. Whoop! <laughs> boom. Oh, boom. <laughs> I think I'm going to use the, this instead. Here we are. Somebody just fell off the cliff of good health. And if that were you or somebody in your family, you'd be delighted to find an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to speed you on to care, right? But if we were concerned about other people who might come along that cliff face, so if we were concerned about population health, community health, public health, we might well ask ourselves, what could we put in place as a health intervention besides just stationing lots of ambulances at the bottom of the cliff? So somebody's going to say, I know, I know, let's Put a net halfway down. That way, even if people fall, we can catch them before they get crunched up at the bottom. So that's an excellent idea. Although the more you think about it, mm, nets do have holes in them, so some people might fall through the cracks. But never mind, let's make that a trampoline halfway down the cliff. No holes in a trampoline. But even if we had a trampoline halfway down that cliff, we might find ourselves with lots of people just bouncing up and down at half functionality, not able to get back to the top of the cliff. So, okay, what else could we put in place as a health intervention? Well, clearly we need to be thinking about a fence at the edge of the cliff to keep people from falling in the first place. But even that fence has to be a very, very strong fence if there's a lot of population pressure against it. So what else could we do as a health intervention? Well, we could move the population away from the edge of the cliff. So let me label these interventions that I've described so far. 
where the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff represents medical care and also what we in public health describe as tertiary prevention, because in public health we talk about three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, tertiary, where tertiary prevention is preventing complications from disease that's already manifest. Okay. So that's our ambulance. So, you know, for example, on the adult side, it would be preventing complications, you know, preventing amputations from, from diabetes, that kind of thing. The net or, or trampoline halfway down, these are our safety net programs which are often in our social services, and so we're trying in our health systems now to have social services co-located and all of that, right, as well as secondary prevention, early detection, screening programs, which can be in our clinical settings as well as in community settings. The fence represents primary prevention, keeping bad things from happening in the first place, like immunizations, pediatricians do a lot of that, as well as anticipatory guidance, pediatricians do a lot of that. Right? So a lot of fence action in pediatrics. Or it could be policy interventions, like a Tobacco 21 policy to, you know, to try to prevent easy access of young people to tobacco products. Moving the population away from the edge of the cliff is what we're describing these days as addressing the social determinants of health. And what are these social determinants of health? Those are the determinants of health and illness that are outside of the individual beyond our individual genes, beyond our individual behaviors, the context of our lives. So, you know, whether you can get fresh fruits and vegetables easily in your neighborhood, for example, so neighborhood context, what's the quality of the schools? You know, what's the quality of the housing? Are there, you know, bus transfer stations in your community or not? They include individual contexts like poverty, you know, education, income, wealth. So addressing poverty is a way of moving the population away from the edge of the cliff, addressing adverse neighborhood conditions and the like. And so if we were to take an outcome like infant mortality and try to figure out where would inter different interventions be along this cliff, well, the ambulance might be our neonatal intensive care unit, the net or trampoline halfway down might be prenatal care, screening for adverse things, conditions occurring during the pregnancy. The fence might be excellent maternal nutrition, so with programs, women, infant, children. Moving the population away from the edge of the cliff might be excellent educational opportunities so that young girls don't have babies so soon. So, you know, we could put lots of different outcomes on this cliff. Nice little cliff. We could have a community conversation. How should we be spending our health resources? How much in ambulances versus net fences are moving the population? But as useful as this cliff has shown itself to be already, it has a huge fatal flaw, and the huge fatal flaw is that it does not yet equip us to talk about how health disparities arise. So keep this clip in the back of your mind, but we're going to shift gears for just a moment to very quickly talk about how health disparities arise, and then we're going to come back to the cliff. Well, especially when we're talking about racial ethnic health disparities, which have a long history in this nation and occur across organ systems, across age groups and the like. When we ask how do health disparities arise, we unfortunately have lots of evidence about differences in the quality of care received within the healthcare system. And the first time that that burst upon the scene in terms of medical practitioners understanding the extent of that was when the uh, Institute of Medicine released its unequal treatment report back in 2002, pulling together what was in hundreds of studies documenting that even if you were in the same system, everybody covered by Medicare or Medicaid in the VA system, or I would say even at a place like Children's National, I don't know if there were any studies in 2002 documenting these differences. But even if you're in the same system, there might be differences, for example, in how vigorously your chest pain might be investigated or treated depending on your race, right? Or differences in how much pain medication you might get if you walked into an emergency department with a long bone fracture depending on your ethnicity. And I heard a very interesting talk this morning by Dr. Goyal, I think, um, isn't it, um, about shining the bright light of inquiry to see is that same kind of thing happening in pediatric emergency departments, right? It's very important for us to ask the question, is there something differential going on? And when the Institute of Medicine pulled together 300 studies back in 2002 saying, yes, there is, and saying that differences in quality of care exist and are contributing to racial ethnic health disparities, that was shattering, mind shattering for many people who are like, but not me, not in my system. But that is not the end all and be all of how health disparities arise because of course some people can't get into a healthcare system in the first place so there are differences in access to care. And then of course we recognize, even though we're health providers, that 
health is not created within the health sector or the health system. So there are differences in the conditions of our lives, our life opportunities, exposures and stresses, which are actually making some individuals and communities sicker than others in the first place. And when you think about these three levels at which health disparities arise, differences in quality of care, differences in access to care, differences in underlying exposures and opportunities, if you wanted to draw it, you could draw it as a pyramid, right? Or better yet, understand it as an iceberg with a huge hidden base of health disparities are differences in the conditions of our lives. And then the very same people who've been made sicker are sometimes frustrated because of limited access to the healthcare system. And then even the lucky ones who get into a system are sometimes further injured because of differences in quality of care. But now, so now let's go back to the cliff, understanding these three levels at which health disparities arise. But now we're going to recognize that we're not really dealing with a flat two-dimensional cliff, but actually we are dealing with a three-dimensional cliff. And at some parts of the cliff, there might be an ambulance there, but maybe that ambulance has a flat tire, so it's slower, goes off in the wrong direction. Or maybe there's no ambulance there at all, and maybe there is no net, no fence. And usually at those parts of the cliff, the population is being pushed closer to the edge. So now let me label these observations about the three-dimensional cliff with how health disparities arise, where the differences in quality of care are represented when an ambulance is there, but it's slow or goes off in the wrong direction. Differences in access to care, no ambulance, no net, no fence, and differences in underlying exposures and opportunities are represented by the closer proximity of that greeny population to the edge. So now that we recognize that we're really dealing with a three-dimensional cliff, there's a whole new set of questions that arise. The so first, of course, is how does a cliff become three-dimensional in the first place? And that's usually because of historical injustices that are perpetuated by present-day contemporary structural factors. But given that the cliff is three-dimensional, we also need to ask, why are there differences in how resources are distributed along this cliff face? And why are there differences in who's found at different parts of the cliff? Why are the oranges back here in a way and the greenies being pushed closer to the edge? And when we start asking and addressing those kinds of questions, we're doing something that differs from addressing the social determinants of health that I describe as moving the population away from the edge of the cliff, addressing poverty, adverse neighborhood conditions, and the like. When you start talking about systems of power that can distribute resources and populations, you're now addressing what I describe as the social determinants of equity or inequity. And these include systems of power like racism, sexism, heterosexism, economic systems like capitalism and the like. So that on this cliff, I've actually distilled three different dimensions, if you will, of health interventions. Go back to your junior high or high school geometry. One dimension is a line, two dimensions is a flat plane, three dimensions is space. Well, along the line at the edge of the cliff is where we can display all of our curative and preventive health services, ambulance, net fence, right there, right? Even, well, I'll tell you this. I know you've all had this experience. If you say the word health, many people will complete that thought for you and go to health care or health services, right? The Affordable Care Act is still a conversation at the edge of the cliff. Even when we finally, I know we will, join the rest of the civilized world and have universal access to high quality health care, right? Even when we do that, that still can be an edge of the cliff conversation. We need to get universal access to high quality health care because that's how a civilized society values all of its people equally. But even when we get there, we can overwhelm any system if everybody is pushed up against the edge. So we must move into that second dimension, which I can display in a flat plane. We must address the social determinants of health, including poverty, adverse neighborhood conditions, and the like. Move that population away from the edge of the cliff if we want to have large and sustained improvements in health outcomes. But the trick there is if we're about moving the population away from the edge of the cliff without recognizing that we're really dealing with a three-dimensional cliff, we're at risk of moving some of the population but not all of the population and actually making health disparities worse. So we must acknowledge and address the three-dimensionality of the cliff, address racism, sexism, heterosexism, capitalism, and the like, if we want to achieve social justice and eliminate health disparities. So I have just given you this cliff analogy that contextualizes the work of everybody in this room. Many of us in this room are trying to be the best ambulance driver that we can be, right? And we're so busy scooping up bodies from the bottom of the cliff and speeding them onto care, and all of us are grateful when that ambulance is there, right? 
But what I'm going to say, even if that's your part of the cliff, or maybe you're at a net, or maybe you're at a fence, or maybe you are collaborating with other sectors, which is what you have to do if you need to be moving the population away from the edge of the cliff. You need to be collaborating with the D.C. public schools. You need to be collaborating with transportation and immigration and the like, right? Wherever you are on this cliff, but especially for those of us who are either training to be excellent ambulance drivers or training others to be that, even if that's our day job, I'm encouraging us, if that's our day job, to wonder, is there a net above me? And how strong is that net? Are there holes in it? Is there a fence? How strong is the fence? How close is the population to the edge? At what part of the cliff am I operating? So even in your day job, wherever you are, to understand the importance of recognizing that you're part of a larger enterprise, and for all of us outside of our day jobs to encourage us as citizens to be very much concerned about addressing the three-dimensionality of the cliff and the differential distribution of resources and populations. So in a general audience, I might stop there and say, well, you know, I've said the word racism two or three times. Nobody fell out of their chair. Let's go. But I want to give, because of where I am, give us an opportunity if there's one or two questions about this clip because I did invite you to join me in conversation, but I didn't go on to say if there is ever anything I say, at any time you can just raise your hand and when I finish my sentence I'll recognize you. But also there are certain points during this presentation where I'll invite your input and this is one of them. Is there anybody with a comment or question or anything, extension of this cliff analogy? Okay, I'm going to wait for at least one. I will. I'll wait for at least one. Yes? Uh, so, it's interesting, because some people say, well, what are we supposed, supposed to do about the cliff? Maybe we're supposed to slope it down. Maybe we're supposed to build up the bottom of it. Maybe for those people who are already being pushed closer to the edge, maybe it's higher there than it is in other parts, and maybe it's uh, when they fall, they're even harder consequences. So, in mine, I, I just have it like this, that there are many people who have added different twists to this to talk about sloping. Um, I would say that when, when we think about our U.S. expenditures in health care, highest among all nations in terms of the percent of our GDP that we're spending on health care, and I know I'm here at Children's National Health System. I do know where I am, so I have some situational awareness. But anyway, um, <laughs> right. But the amount of money that we're spending on health care does not buy us good stuff in health outcomes. We're about 30th in infant mortality rate, 30th in life expectancy, all of that. But if we add how much we as a nation spend on health care with how much we spend on social services and then compare that to other developed nations, they're spending less on health care but more on social services. We're about even when you look at those combined expenditures, right? And so it shows – and they're getting much better outcomes for their expenditures. So it shows us that it's a matter of our, how we distribute that same amount of health care plus social services money. But the way I think about that on the cliff is I think those other countries are building up from the base when they're spending on, on health services so that even if somebody falls, that they don't fall as far, they don't hurt themselves as much. Because I think of um, social class as kind of the distance from the edge of the cliff. And there is income inequality in other countries, and there's social class gradients and all. But the way that health tracks with social class in this country is very tight, right? <laughs> in some Western European cultures, countries, even though they're our social class differences, because they provide all of the social services, health does not track the social class as tightly as it does in our setting. So anyway, thank you for that question. Um, I, I'm going to just give you two other questions that people have asked before, which is, one is, why are we as a nation spending so much money on ambulances at the bottom of the cliff if this is a good representation of how we could be spending our health resources? That's an important question. I think there are two answers to that. One, there's a lot of money being made down there, you know, by health systems and physicians and medical care, med medical device people and pharmaceuticals. You know, that's sort of a cynical answer, but it's a true answer, right? But the other more profound answer is that we are so narrowly focused as a nation on the individual that we don't even recognize that there's been a health problem until somebody's fallen off the cliff. We are not using the proximity of populations to the edge of the cliff as a health problem and recognizing and responding in that way. Or other aggregate measures we might have of health or, you know, uh, income inequality or social cohesion or, you know, there are aggregate measures that we could be using. We just count 
bodies at the bottom of the cliff one by one, and we respond that way. We also have a very narrow, um, a very, we're ahistorical, I would say, which is another issue that causes us problems, so that the ahistorical aspect on this cliff, some people might ask, why are the greenies being, why are they running and launching themselves over the edge of that cliff? Why are they eating so much fried chicken? Why don't they just such and such with their kids? You know what? And we ask that kind of question because, first of all, when you're narrowly focused on the individual, you don't see uh, systems and structures, so we don't see the invisible hand that's pushing people closer to the edge. But also we're ahistorical, and we don't even understand what structures the three-dimensionality of the cliff and the distribution of resources and populations. We act as if this situation that we're looking at right now was disconnected from the past, right, and as if the current advantage of the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. There's a third big barrier to achieving health equity, narrow focus on the individual, the fact that we are ahistorical. The third is that we endorse the myth of meritocracy. I hope to leave myself enough time at the end to talk about that more. But this story that goes something like this, if you work hard, you'll make it. Like that's a big part of what we learned, Horatio Alger, pull yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever. But I will say, I, recognize, I call it a myth of meritocracy, recognizing that most people who have made it have worked hard, not taking that away from anybody, right? Not everybody who's made it has worked hard, but most people who have made it have worked hard. But there are many, many, many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field, right? But our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy enables us to just look at this picture and think that that's fine, that this situation is fine, because if those greenies just tried a little bit harder, they wouldn't be that close to the edge of the cliff, and they would have built some, some fences and the like, right? So the myth of meritocracy makes us complacent with this situation right now. But anyway, I'm not going to stay here. I am going to say I talked about racism. I said the word now about six times. Nobody, you know, got crazy, so let's go. I'm going to, I'm going to now define racism for you. And this definition starts with the observation, well, in my definition, that racism is a system. So when I say the word racism, I'm not describing an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. I am talking about a system of power and a system of doing what? It's a system of doing two things, structuring opportunity and assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured and on what basis is the value assigned is based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race in this country. I just give you myself as an example, right? So here I am in D.C. You look at me, I'm clearly black. In some parts of Brazil, you look at me and I'd be just as clearly white. In South Africa, you look at me, I'd be just as clearly colored. Here I am, same physical appearance, but the social interpretation of my appearance in those three settings would assign me to three different racial groups, and furthermore, if I were to stay in any of those settings long enough, then my health outcome would probably take on that of the group to which I've been assigned, even though I'd have the same genes in all three places. And it's not just me. Everybody in this room, there's someplace else on this earth where your race would be different than what you think of yourself here today. Okay. So race is that social interpretation of how one looks in a race-conscious society. Racism is the system that operates on that so-called race to structure opportunity and assign value. Now, what are the impacts of this system? Well, when we do think or talk about racism at all in this country, which is not often enough, but when we do, we understand that racism unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. But it shouldn't take us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage. So racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities, which we hardly ever, ever talk about. That's what some people call unearned white privilege. And the reason we don't talk about that is because it makes some people, especially some white people, uncomfortable. And I recognize that I may have just made some people in this audience uncomfortable, and I am not trying to make you uncomfortable, but also I have abandoned my commitment to white comfort. And so if you are uncomfortable, I say either lean in or shake it off or do whatever you have to do, and please stay in this conversation because it's a very important conversation, right? So there's a third impact of racism that goes beyond the unfair disadvantage or the reciprocal unfair advantage, and that third impact is how racism is sapping the strength of our whole society through the waste of human resources. There are many examples of that. 
One huge one is how we as a nation are not yet vigorously investing in the full, excellent public education of all of our children. In fact, we're going quite the opposite, I guess, at least in terms of the leadership, right? But the reason we're not doing that because there are some people with, whose blinders, the blinders of racism have made them think there's no genius in the barrios or in the ghettos or in the reservations. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. But of course, we know there is genius in all of our communities. And if we were to only vigorously invest in and fully invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as a nation or even as a world. And I often say that we might already be up on Mars farming if that were a good idea, if we were to invest in all that genius. But then we wouldn't even have to go to Mars. We could be solving the many problems in our communities today if we were to invest in all of that genius. Another huge example of how these same blinders that don't value all of us equally have affected the nation is how they have made us as a nation complacent with what I describe as a wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many black and brown men in our prison system as if that didn't separate us from human potential. And if you know folks, if you personally know folks who are either stuck in the system or cycling in and out, because, you know, if you come out with a felony conviction, it's hard to get a job, hard to get housing. Many places you can't even vote again. So we have to interrupt all that, the, the disproportionate incarceration and the cycling in and out. We need to welcome our returning citizens, right? But if you know any of these people, then you know that there are many geniuses caught up in this system that if there had only been some other way could be contributing quite productively to our society. And I actually think that that impact, how racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources, that is the most imp important impact for us to be talking about these days, right now, I think. We need more media stories about that. We need more data collection. I was meeting with a group of researchers earlier. I challenge you all to think about what kinds of data can we be collecting and analyzing to, to document how racism is sapping the strength of the whole society. What will that look like? That's for the next generation of researchers, right? We need more conversations about that reality around our dinner table so that more people will be filled with a sense of urgency to dismantle the system and put into place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potential. I want, before I leave this slide, and I'm looking at the time, and I know I'm just talking, and I have three other stories I want to tell you, okay? But, but I want to say this. I was, I, so before I was at Moore House School of Medicine, I was at CDC for 14 years. Before that, I taught at the Harvard School of Public Health. The six. At CDC, in my last year there, because then I escaped because of this, <laughs> I was in a part of CDC where the person who was to review my presentations, the associate director for science who had to clear my presentations, heard me speaking. He used to clear my presentations without a problem. Then he heard me speaking and understood with what clarity I communicated. And he told me, I needed to take that point about unfairly advantages folks off of my slide. He said, you already talked about the unfair disadvantage. You need to take that thing about unfair advantage off of your slide. And the compromise, after, you know, struggling, struggling, was that if I took the word unfairly off, then I could talk about disadvantage and, un and advantage, as long as I didn't characterize any of them as unfair. That interaction taught me a lot, and what it taught me was that in this country there are many people who think there is disadvantaged and normal. Right? Disadvantaged and normal. And the reason people think that is, again, because we as a nation are ahistorical. And folks do not understand or recognize that their so-called normal is built up on a whole mountain of unfair advantage. It's an important thing for us to keep in mind. So now I'm going to shift to a story that is uh, sparked by something I saw in my own real life where I got a very deep understanding of how racism works. This story was sparked by my experience as a medical student. I was a very studious medical student, so I was with some friends, and we were in my apartment studying long and hard, and it got late, we got hungry, and I had no food in the apartment. So never mind, we're going to go into town to get something to eat. So we walk into town, and we find a restaurant, and we go in and we sit down, and the menus are presented, and we order our food. Food is served. Here we are eating. Not a very 
enlightening story yet, right? <laughs> You're like, well, I did that last night, right? Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. But as I sat there with my friends, I looked across the room, and I noticed a sign, and that sign was a startling revelation to me about racism. So, so now you're trying to remember, where did she go to medical school? Right? Like, what could that sign say? Well, let me tell you what the sign said. The sign said, open. So now I know I've lost most of you. So let me recap. Here we are, sitting in a restaurant, eating. I look across the room, and I see a sign that says, open. And if I hadn't thought anything more about it, I would have assumed other hungry people could come in, sit down, order their food, and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognize that now because of the hour, the restaurant was actually closed. And that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of the sign, would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food, and eat. And that's when I understood how racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. It is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. It is difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context, except we got a little taste of that with Ebola, did we not? But for those on the outside, they're very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims close to them that they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant to those who say, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act. So that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, then you can even talk to the restaurant owner, who is, after all, inside with you. You can say, restaurant owner, why don't you open the door again? There are hungry people outside. Let them come in. You'll make more money and all the conversations we could have. Or maybe you'll pass food through the door. Maybe you'll break the glass. Or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign, right? But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat, because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So I tell this story to help people get a real sense of, yeah, racism does exist, even though in your life experience it never seemed to exist for you in your neighborhood. And your parents never talked to you about it. And I mean, it's sort of like I had a three-hour conversation once when I asked a group of folks in, the, in Flint, how could people who were born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of the sign? We talked about it for three hours. I don't have three hours now. So not, we're not going to do that now. But there are many ways. They could wonder, what are the people outside saying? Why are they saying, you know, black lives matter? Don't they know all lives matter? Right? Well, find out. Why are they saying that? Right? What is, what is, it? What is that assertion of humanity that they're saying? You might wonder, why aren't more people coming in here? You might wonder lots of things. Maybe... Oh, I, I, I'm going off on a three-hour conversation now, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to now um, switch to another framing because I just define racism as a system. It's that system is that two-sided sign or multi-sided sign, right, that unfairly disadvantages, unfairly advantages others and saps the strength of the whole society. But how could it turn into increased numbers of our babies dying before their first birthday? in some communities versus others? How could it turn into differences in asthma prevalence or obesity prevalence? How could it turn into health? And in order to understand that, I talk about three levels of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized to not only help us understand how could racism turn into a health outcome, but what should we do about it? So I'm going to very briefly um, define these levels of racism and illustrate them with another of my allegories. So institutionalized racism is the system, if you will. It's that constellation of structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that taken together result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that does not require an identifiable perpetrator because 
It's been institutionalized in our laws and customs and background norms. This is the kind of racism that shows up as inherited disadvantage or as reciprocal inherited advantage. We see it in terms of material conditions. We see it in terms of access to power. So we see it in terms of differential access by race to quality housing or excellent educational opportunities, equal employment opportunities, or even the same level of income at the same level of employment. And clearly those things impact health. Differential access to medical facilities, including, including linguistic access. In differential access to a clean environment and the whole differential placement of toxic dump sites or bus transfer stations or testing of nuclear weapons in the Pacific atolls, you know, differential in communities of color. And then it's power. Power is information, which could be health information or even information about our own histories. Power as resources, not just capital resources, but social networking resources, knowing somebody on the board, and power as voice in government, media, and the like. Now, sometimes, right about now, somebody will raise their hand and say, Dr. Jones, when you say housing, education, employment, and income, that's what we, when we say those words, we mean social class. So why do you have that on your slide about racism? Are you talking about racism or are you actually talking about social class? It's an important question, right? My answer starts with the observation that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in this country are overrepresented in poverty while white people in this country are overrepresented in wealth. That's not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized or stigmatized or oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical injustice. So for American Indians, that was the taking of the land and the near genocide and moving survivors to reserve lands, reservations. And then in some instances, something good was found under one reservation. Oops, you've got to pick them up and move them somewhere else. I usually have time to go through a whole litany of all of the different marginalized, oppressed, stigmatized groups and their histories. But I'm going to come to the last one that I usually talk about because I'm conscious of my time and say for people of African descent, that initial historical injustice was the kidnapping of West African people and our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage, and then for the survivors and their progeny for generations and generations and generations, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country. But when I start talking like that, then some people are like, oh, Dr. Jones, there you go talking about slavery. Dr. Jones, we all recognize that slavery was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history, right? But Dr. Jones, the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865, and we're in 2018, that's 153 years ago. Dr. Jones, really, all else being equal, don't you think the impact of slavery would have washed out by now? But the key phrase there is all else being equal. And all else has not been equal since 1865, and all else still is not equal today, and there's still what I describe as present-day contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating each of the initial historical injustices that I could have documented for you. And those initial, those contemporary structural factors are part and parcel of institutionalized racism. So when you ask me, am I talking about racism or am I talking about social class, my response is that racism, institutionalized racism, explains why we even see an association between social class and race in this country. It doesn't just so happen. This is a very important aha, which is not to say it's not crucial that we address poverty. We must address poverty. We must address white poverty, black poverty, Indian, you know, red poverty, brown poverty, Latino, all poverty. If I had a magic wand today to eliminate poverty across this land, I would certainly use it. Boom. And we need to be putting our magic minds to that, right? I would go further. I'd eliminate income inequality. But the warning is that if I were to eliminate any uh, income inequality today but did not dismantle the structures, policies, practices, norms, and values, the mechanisms of institutionalized racism which are deeply embedded in the fabric of our nation and were deliberately put in place to shunt different people into different possibilities. Even if I flattened the whole thing out today, but if I did not address institutionalized racism, then in one generation, in 20 years, we would start to see a stratification by race again in terms of income. This is not an either or proposition. This is a both and. Before I leave institutionalized racism, I also need to say that it can be through manifest through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. And very, very often, institutionalized racism shows up as inaction in the face of need. The second level of racism, personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. This is what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. It includes the different idea, the prejudice, and then the different action, the discrimination. So implicit bias or unconscious bias is all up in here, right? 
Examples of how can adversely impact health? Police brutality. I don't have time to go through a whole litany of names. New ones keep jumping up on the national scene every week, at least one or two every week. Ask me, somebody, if we have time at the end, ask me about the, no, never mind. I'm not even going to go there. Okay. Well, somebody asked me about the woman who drove up to the CIA last Friday and is now in detention. Okay. If you didn't hear about that, ask me about that. Okay. Physician disrespect. Physician disrespect can be as subtle as a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the physician figures, well, you know, that patient couldn't afford, wouldn't comply, wouldn't understand, or it could be as blatant as sterilization abuse, which has had many iterations in our nation's history. Shopkeeper vigilance, being followed around in stores, a waiter indifference, not getting quick respectful treatment. These are the microaggressions, the subtle communication of disrespect, everyday racism. And teacher devaluation. When a teacher looks at a young child and thinks that child can't learn and puts them off in the ADHD track, that child, now I know we're pediatricians. My husband is a developmental pediatrician, so I'm, you know, like I know that there are people who do have, you know, <laughs> ADHD. But when a teacher looks at a young child and just puts them off there, that child won't even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. Personally mediated racism, like institutionalized, can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. But even more important is to recognize that this level of racism can be unintentional as well as intentional. You do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism, internalized racism, I'm just going to define here from the point of view of members of stigmatized races as acceptance by members of stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. Of course, the internalized sense of entitlement that many white people walk around with is also internalized racism. I don't have it on this slide right now because for a while I didn't even understand how that could cause adverse health impact, but maybe, maybe it's associated with the opioid epidemic or suicide or, you know, if, so I'm, you know, we could talk about that later too. If I had more time, I would talk about that. But on this slide, I'm talking from the point of view of members of stigmatized races. That internalized racism results in self-evaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as, maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or apply to that college or get that job or live in that neighborhood. It also is manifest as white man's ISIS culture syndrome, that phraseology that comes from my parents' generation. What it meant then for people of color is still meant, means for many of us today. So say I'm black and I need a lawyer, you know what, I might seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer, or if I'm sick, I might prefer a white doctor or, over a black doctor. In fact, if my lemonade were warm, I might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. Turns into resignation, helplessness, hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors. And really it's about members of stigmatized races accepting the limitations to our own full humanity, the box into which we've been placed. So that when young high school students of color are teasing one of their friends of color who's trying to be the valedictorian by saying, well, you know, so-and-so is trying to be white. We need to challenge that, right? Since when do white people claim exclusive access to excellence? They did not. So that's a manifestation of internalized racism. So here's this story. This story was sparked by my experience newly married to my husband. We're moving out to Baltimore. I'm going to finish my PhD. We bought our first cute little freestanding house. Nice little house with a big wraparound porch. The flower boxes dotted all on the porch. And we bought the house in October. That wasn't really the time to plant. But when spring came, my husband, who loves the garden, ran out with our marigold seeds for to decorate our cute little house. And then he ran right back in because he said, you know, Kamara, some of the boxes have dirt in them, but some of these boxes are empty. Let me go down to the gardening store. So he goes down to the gardening store, and he hauls back big old bags of potting soil, right? And we put, we fill up those empty boxes. And then we put equal numbers of marigold seeds in all of the boxes, and we water them all, and then I'm not the gardener in the family, so at this point, oh, I'm exhausted. So I decide I'm just going to sit back and just be delighted, you know. So a few weeks later, a few weeks later, I'm walking out of my house onto the porch, and I actually took a good look at those flower boxes. And when I looked at those flower boxes, I literally stopped in my tracks because what I saw made me think that we had planted completely different species in some boxes versus others because some of the boxes, boxes were full of plants, and they were tall and vigorous looking. And some of the boxes just had a few plants in them. They were scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. That potting soil that we had bought 
turned out to be rich, fertile soil so that every single seed planted in the rich, fertile soil had at least sprouted. The so strong seeds had grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed made it halfway up. But that old soil that we have found in the boxes turned out to be poor, rocky soil. So the weak seed planted in the poor, rocky soil just died. And even the strong seed in the poor, rocky soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. And some of you guys are nodding. So there are some gardeners in this room, and maybe you've composted half of your garden, right? And maybe you've seen this image with your own real eyes, and the image is about the importance of the soil, the importance of the environment. But now I'm going to take this image, and I'm going to make it a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we're going to have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seeds for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms, and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms. And the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed and puts it in the rich, fertile soil, pink seed in the poor, rocky soil. Three weeks later in her boxes, she sees what I saw in mine. In that rich, fertile soil, all the red seeds sprout, strong red seed, tall and vigorous, weak red seed makes it halfway up. In that poor, rocky soil, the weak pink seed dies. Here comes the strong pink seed struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in those flower boxes, those flowers go to seed. And then next year, same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens. So finally, about 10 years later, the gardener is looking at her flower boxes, and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we interrupt the story there to say the first part of the story is how institutionalized racism works. We have the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You have contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate, and then through inaction in the face of the perpetuation of the inequity. But let's take the story back up to say, well, where's personally mediated racism in this garden? Well, the gardener's looking over at the red flowers, and she says, oh, these red flowers are so beautiful. And then she looks at the pink flowers, and she says, those pink flowers are scrawny and scraggly, so she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich, fertile soil, so she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not understanding or acknowledging that they're benefiting from enriched soil. Pink flowers are looking over at red, thinking red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And here come the bees. And the bees are minding their own business, collecting nectar, but of course pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee into one of the pink flowers, and then to another pink flower, and to this pink flower, and this flower is like, get away from me, bee, do not bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we can start by addressing the internalized racism, so we can go over to the pink flowers and say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is an important, <laughs> that is an important intervention. Not making light of that, but if that's all we do, it's not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. So then you can say, okay, well, let's address the personally mediated racism. So. Let's, I'm almost finished. If you could just stay with me for a little bit more, and then those who have to turn into pumpkins at one, you can go. But just, just stay with me. I'm almost done. So if you want to address the personally mediated racism, we could have a conversation with the gardener. Or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. It's all good. So we have our workshop. In the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? Maybe she will, maybe she won't. But even if she does. It still won't change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. If we really want to set things right in the garden, we must address the institutionalized racism, which means we have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's all right, too, although it makes it easier for the gardener to keep segregating resources going forward. But if you do that, if you keep separate boxes, what it means is that you have to enrich that poor, rocky soil until it is as rich as the rich, fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious. So that in that intervention on the institutionalized racism, you'll have also addressed the internalized. Because pink won't be looking over at red, thinking red is better. Or wanting to be red. And you may also address the personally mediated. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave burning red over pink. But her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful would be less likely to have that attitude. So the story has been to illustrate that to, if we want to set things right in the garden, we must at least address the institutionalized racism. Here's the last slide on this. Who is the gardener? After all, the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act, and control of resources. Right? Which are the elements of self-determination. Well, in our context, government is a huge part of the gardener, but not the only part. Media, foundations, corporations. 
communities to the extent they have self-determination. Whoever the gardener is, it's dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think that her garden is beautiful because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. And our challenge is what to do about the gardener. Do we make the gardener scribe, poke it out of fuchsia? Do the pink flowers have to grow, recruit their own gardener? Many questions can come out of this. And so I recognize that many of you have to run, but um, I have a few other slides, um, just about 10 more minutes that other people want to say. But at this point, thank you very much for those of you who have to leave. It's 1 o'clock. Thank you. For those of you who have to go now, and then for the rest, I have about 10 more minutes, if that's possible. Um, I actually want to share with you two questions on this and then take questions. Or um, may I, So may I share two questions that I've been asked before about this and then take your questions? I think that's a good use of our time. So I was once asked, Dr. Jones, excuse me, why should the red flowers share their soil? You know, when I heard that question, I loved that question because it showed me the power of this story to start conversations about racism that would otherwise be difficult if we were talking about racism between you and me, right? My answer to that question, why should the red flowers share their soil, is that actually that soil doesn't belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the whole garden. Right? But the other question is, what if that's not the original gardener we're looking at? What if that's the gardener's great, 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 great grandchild? Here we are, right? What then? Because that great, 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 great grandchild has always seen the garden looking like that. May not even think there's a problem to be solved. My answer to that challenge is, first of all, we must make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem requiring urgent solution. To have that, we must have a deep conviction that actually the pink and the red seeds are the same, you know, are equal. We have to have that sense of equal potential, right? But with that thing, then we must make that difference a problem requiring urgent solution. But then, how are we going to solve it? Well, the second part of the answer is that we must make those flower boxes transparent. We have to be talking about the differences in the quality of the soil. But then the third part is even as we make those flower boxes transparent, we also need to be crystal clear with everyone that the pink seed did not just go launch themselves into that poor rocky soil. So we have to talk about history, and we have to talk about how the gardener's initial preference for red over pink set up the whole situation. Some people might call that cultural racism. In our context right now, we might call it white supremacist ideology. We must address that because if we do not, even if we were to compel the gardener to equalize the soil today, if she continues to prefer red over pink, she will continue to privilege red over pink going forward. So with that, I would love to take your questions and comments. And if not, then I have other stuff that I can share with you. <laughs> Any questions? Well, let me just um, I just want to say, I talked a little bit about this before. The importance of asking how is racism operating here is that we need to identify mechanisms in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. Where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision making, especially who's at the table and who's not, and what's on the agenda and what's not. So any time that we find ourselves at decision making tables, we need to look around and say, who is not here, who has an interest in this proceeding, and then don't just try to represent their interests, get them away to the table, right? And the structures of the who, what, when, and where of decision-making policies are the written how, practices, and norms of the unwritten how, and values are the why, and the values piece is very important. I used to be all about structures, right, until I recognized that thing that I said, that racism is a system of both structuring opportunity and assigning value. And if we don't address that values piece, even if we do a short-term fix on the opportunity structures, it will not stay. It will not hold. The definition I gave you of racism can be generalized to be a definition of sexism or any other system of inequity. What is sexism? A system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on gender that unfairly disadvantages, unfairly advantages, and saps the strength of the whole society. There are many axes of inequity operating in our society today, intersecting in communities and individuals. Recognizing this, I still think that all of us must be anti-racist, at least, even as we address these others as well, because racism is foundational in our nation's history, and yet many people are in denial of its continued existence and profound impacts on the health and well-being of the nation. Here's a three-part definition of health equity. I won't dwell on it long, except to say, what is it? It's health equity is a process. It's an assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. This is what I want you to remember. Getting there requires at least these three things, valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices and providing resources according to need, not equally, but according to need. 
and health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. Health disparities is counting different numbers of different colored bodies at the bottom of the cliff, or counting, you know, the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers. Health equity is all that stuff that came before. There are three huge barriers to achieving health equity. I talked about them before. One is our narrow focus on the individual, which makes systems and structures invisible or irrelevant. The second is that we're ahistorical. We act as if the present. We're disconnected from the past. And this is the current event, distribution of advantage and disadvantage is just a happenstance. And the third is this myth of meritocracy, right? And when we say that if you work hard, you'll make it, then we are not recognizing that that is not the case. There are many other people who are working just as hard or harder than those who have made it who won't make it because of the uneven playing field, which is structured and perpetuated by racism and all those other systems of structured inequity. So when we deny racism, we are implicitly shoring up this myth of meritocracy, right? How do you deny racism? One way is to say, I do not think racism exists. Another way to deny racism is to never say the word. Because if you never say the word in this setting in which we're in widespread denial of racism, then you're complicit with that denial. Here's a very quick thing. Whoever heard of this thing, International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination? Wave your hand. Hi. Okay, so a few people. What is it? It's an international anti-racism treaty that was adopted by the UN General Assembly way back in 65. Who even knew? that there was an international anti-racism treaty, nine pages. Do you think the U.S. signed this treaty? Of course not. <laughs> yes, we did. 1966. Trip there, we can sign any treaty we want. It doesn't have any effect until the Senate ratifies it. Do you think the U.S. Senate ratified this treaty? Mm, you think that's a trick question, don't you? And it was, because yes, we ratified the treaty 28 years later. We have international treaty obligations today to do right under this nine-page treaty, where one of the obligations is to submit periodic reports. So every six years, our State Department submits a report. This last one in 2013, 69-page report about how we're doing. Anybody else can submit a report, too. Children's National can submit a parallel report, and the committee will read all of the reports. And then they consider it all together, and then they send back to each country their concluding observations. The 2014 concluding observations of our most recent is only 14 pages. I recommend that you read that. It's not a telephone book. It starts out, dear United States, thank you for your report. We remain concerned about racial profiling, residential segregation, the achievement gap in education, differential access to health care, disproportionate incarceration, and on and on and on. And not only do they remain concerned, there's specific recommendations in each of these areas, including recommendations that we that our people know about the existence of this treaty. So every time I talk, I try to do my part. And that we recommend that the U.S., that the state party adopt a national action plan to combat structural racial discrimination. So our challenge that I started with today is to expand our conversation, to go beyond health services, to addressing the social determinants of health, very important, addressing poverty, adverse neighborhood conditions, and the like, but then to go beyond that to address the social determinants of equity, including, or inequity, including racism, sexism, and the like, with three tasks, to name racism, to ask how is racism operating here, and then to organize and strategize to act. I encourage all of you guys to become part of Me Too Against Racism, right? There we go. Thank you. Now, if, if you have questions, I don't know if we still have time in this room or not, but questions or comments? Sorry, can I help? Already over, we'll be over a little more. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, I just was really I'm super curious what you, how or if you think that these ideas about trauma and the way that they have epigenetic effects or individual health effects fit into your construct. So um, we, we do see that that's true, but I don't, I think of it as uh, when we enrich the poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil, I, and within two generations, all of that will have washed out. So when we first enrich the poor rocky soil, the flowers that are already sort of sprouted in that might grow up maybe a little bit more, 
but really we won't see the impact until the next generation, so in our context, 20 years. So when we make investments in enriching the soil, we shouldn't expect to see something in two years, three years, five years. We need to make concerted 20-year generational investments in a place. So then when we see when the seed falls into that rich soil, that's when we're really going to see a boost. But maybe that seed had a little bit of epigenetic stuff going, but when, that, when the seed from that one falls into the soil, I think we'll be all washed out. So I don't like, I, I don't like the kind of biologizing again what are social factors. We, we are so narrowly focused on the individual, we would rather go inside and try to figure out how can we modify genes and all than take a good square look at the systems and structures which are plain as day, but because we're ahistorical and we're narrowly focused on the individual, we don't even think that they are potentially changeable. So we, we must pay attention to systems and structures. Um, they have effects on us. They are, you know, embodied, as my colleague Nancy Krieger talked about, how, you know, these things are embodied. But I think that it's, then, then we have to deal with those, and then the embodiment will undo itself. Other questions or comments? Yes. Over here. Oh, over here. I just okay. wanted, thank you, first off. This was amazing. Um, I wanted to just give you a reminder. You had mentioned there was a story you wanted to tell. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you that story, and then I'm just going to wrap into another story, and then I see another. Okay, so this is just something I heard this morning on the radio. I don't know the name of it. So last Friday, apparently, a woman drove her car up to the front of the CIA compound or whatever, and when asked for her badge, she gave a, sign, a, a note, and then the officer said, well, do you speak? And she nodded. And then she started reaching for her purse, and he said, keep your hands there. And then he says, what are you reaching for? And then she wrote a note, gun, right? And now she's in detention. You said, why are you talking to us about that? Come on. Okay. I haven't seen a picture of her, and we probably won't see a picture of her for three more weeks, but what do you think I think I know about her? She's white. Why do I think that I know that about her? Because she's still alive. Because she's in detention. If she had been black or Hispanic or, you know, or Muslim looking, or she would be dead. So I don't know if this is true or not. I'm going way out here in front of an audience. I don't know you people. And you might go back and say, oh, my God, did you hear all the racist is she? Like, she just... But I'm just going to tell you, I bet, because I had the experience when I was a, a, a graduate student, there was a middle school principal who was arrested for selling marijuana to her middle school students. And when we did not see her picture on the 6 o'clock news, we knew she was white because she didn't confirm that for three weeks. We didn't see a picture of her for three weeks. So that's all to say, and I, I why am I thinking about it? Because because Stefan Clark, with his cell phone in his backyard, is dead. 20 bullets from behind. The brother, I don't have his name, in New York last year, the welder holding the pipe, dead. And here's a woman who says, I have a gun at the front of the CA, doing strange things, writing notes and stuff like that. Right? And she's in detention. So I would just ask all of you guys, whenever you hear things and whenever you walk through life, say, well, what would... How would it have been if that one had been black? Or how would it have been if that one had been white? Just do the contrapositive, like, stop putting yourself, how would this have happened? You know, many white people, when they talk about, oh, that was lucky, what they're actually reporting is white privilege. When you have a friend tell you, especially if they're white, and say, that was lucky, they have just recognized white privilege but haven't put those words on it. They, they recognize that something happened that, they, that really might not have happened. And I've just, I've experienced that in my life. So that's a, a little thing. So then, now you all are like, oh, there she goes with that white skin privilege again. Would she please get off of that? So here, I want to address that. Um, I know that many white people are poor. In fact, if you look at all poor people in this country, the largest group of poor people are white people, right? It, it used to be in the majority. Now it's the plurality. So if you take all the groups, it's not more than 50% now, but it's the largest group. But even poor white people have white skin privilege. When I was at CDC, we were investing in a project in North Carolina to do job training for poor black and white women. And so, you know, CDC would go and do site visits and stuff like that. And there was a site visit. I wasn't going to be able to go. So I gave my five slides to my colleague. Would you please present my five slides on racism when you go there? And she said, Kamara, really? Why do you want to talk to them about racism? The one thing they have in common is that they are all poor. 
And I responded, actually, they have two things in common. They are all poor, and they all live in a racist society. But they experience that second thing differently, right? So do you remember in McKinney, Texas, outside of Dallas, now three summers ago, there was a group of young teens that were going to celebrate their birthday at a pool in one of their neighborhoods. So they went to the pool, and the people who were already at the pool objected to their being there and called the police. And what we saw was this young black girl being dragged by her hair, and the police officer sat on her. And we saw these young black boys sitting on the curb with their hands handcuffed behind their backs. So I want to ask you, how do we know about that thing that happened? And most people don't know how we know about that. And I didn't know until the next day when I heard a young white boy being interviewed on TV saying, it was almost as if I were invisible to the police. He was in the friend group. He was at the party. He was part of the friend group. He saw what was happening to his friends. He could have run home for safety. But recognizing his white skin privilege that made him almost invisible to the police, he stood up right in the middle of all that mayhem and taped it, recorded it. So I urge all of you guys, instead of saying, don't give me white skin privilege, I don't have that, recognize that if you are living as white in this country, you have white skin privilege, embrace it and then use it. And it's not about being an ally, because if you're an ally, you're allied to somebody else's struggle and, oh, you know, you have to go on vacation for a month, you know, check you in a month, right? This is all of our struggle. It's your struggle, too. So use that white skin privilege to start conversations where I will never be heard or invited. There was a question over here. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones, for your talk and your commitment to this work. Um, I'm curious to know what advice you would give to trainees. Um, that, you know, we're all trained into the ambulances, like your, um, like your analogy. What are some ways that we can shape our career mm -hmm. to do more work in, on top of the cliff? Okay, thank you very much. So I guess the first thing is to, um, to recognize that even in, in that role, um, to burst through bubbles. I, I think I'm going to say to burst through bubbles. We're all in a bubble. We're all in a bubble of our our, you know, work and our kids and our neighborhood and stuff like that. And we, most of us, some of the bubbles are big bubbles with thin soap bubble borders, and some are very small bubbles with thick plexiglass. glass. But we're all in a bubble not knowing that just across town there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances, right? So we need to create opportunities in our training programs and all of this to have people burst through bubbles and experience our common humanity in very different circumstances to, to recognize that. We, it comes into our clinical spaces all the time, but we do not go often into the spaces from which our patients, where they're living, their environments. So home visiting, you know, don't just do a social determinants of health screen on the electronic health record. Do home visits. Work in communities. You know, become parts of, of, um, of community efforts. Organize, like really Really do that. I even, when I was at CDC, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if CDC required every employee to spend half a day every other week at a prison or in a senior center or in a child care center just to get to know people as real humans in very different circumstances. So to the extent that we can create opportunities to burst through bubbles, create partnership things, um, you know, they, now they, there's the, the medical law stuff, which is good, which might help us edge and, and recognize influences on people's lives that are outside of our real uh, expertise. But then the other thing is to recognize that you have a day job and then you're a citizen. And even if your day job is in the ED like that and, and you're trying to be responsive and trying to do that and you're, and you're trying to point out and asking why, I would say when you see things going down instead of just letting things pass, challenge people. If you see something and you think that's not really quite right, then challenge people not like, oh, what you just did was blah, blah, blah. They say, why did you do that? So to have people carry the why question, not only about other actions, but why is my patient coming in in this situation? Don't just take things for granted, to, to dig deeply, but as citizens to become actively involved, as physicians especially, uh, but all healthcare providers in this room, we have a level of respect that we can take with us to put things on agendas, become active on the school board or whatever. All of us should be deeply involved in the schools in our neighborhoods, even if we don't have children, if our children are grown, if our children are not in public school or whatever, because we can't, what keeps some people from investing in the public schools is like, well, my kids, I can't fix them in time for my kids. And then when their kids grow up, then they're not concerned about the schools. Each of us 
lived in a public school district for elementary, middle, and high. Just pick one and do something with that school. Go and read. Get on the, you know, be, help fundraise. You know, do something with the school. So, so become deeply involved outside of our day jobs and outside of our narrow little selves. Try to create community.